you were flagged because you had submitted your DNA for your own background? Yes. Okay. So both of my adoptive parents passed, my mother in 2014 and then my dad in 2016, about 22 months apart. And so 2017, um, I decided to do a DNA test just to find out my origin. My mom, Pam, my adopted mom, she could never have children. Gotcha. Um, and so that was always very special. <laughs> Take your time. Wow. Take your time. And so early on and like um, talking with my biological mom, Donna, I always wanted her to know like her selfless act of, you know, giving me up really meant the world because she gave my adoptive mom a chance to... <laughs> You're going to get me crying. <laughs> Just because I don't believe or agree doesn't mean I can't learn from you. Why did you have to bring that up? Okay, <laughs> that one I'm super embarrassed about. <laughs> Do you like me? Do I like you? Yeah. As, a, as an individual or as yeah, a podcast? Yeah, as, as a person. No, I person. like you. Okay, cool. Yeah. cool. And I don't have any interest in appearing to be stronger than I am. I ain't bowed a Nebuchadnezzar statue. He gonna leave. You feel me? How do we love people who see the world differently than we do? What would it look like if we truly loved all of our neighbors? Could listening to their stories be the first step? This is Seacoast Church, and there's way more to talk about. All right, well, welcome to the Seacoast Podcast. Everybody here <laughs> with my friends Amy and Lynn, who are just smiling. Yes. Y'all just, we, y'all just we love it. happy we're to be together. here. Yeah. We do. Yeah. I mean, are y'all happy to be with me, too? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're so excited. All you wear right. my favorite color, awesome. green. I love awesome. it. You look like Christmas. You got green and red. No, that's orange. Oh, that looks red totally, to me. Nope, totally orange. It's like a burnt orange. orange a yeah. burnt. I think this something's looks like, like a burnt like a, shirt. No, yes, something's oh, wow. wrong with my eyes because no. I did the whole wrong with that dress too. My wife is colorblind. Do you know that? And her oh. father wanted to join the military and he couldn't because he was colorblind. But oh. listen to this. So I bought Priscilla before we were married this really nice bag from the Gap. I mean, it's, it's a really nice bag. I don't know if the Gap still makes nice bags, but this one. No, wait a second. I don't think it was from the Gap. I don't remember. It was better than Gap. But anyway, she used, Crew, to, she used to, yeah, she used to call it her brown bag. We hand me her brown bag, and I just thought it was like a nickname that she had given it because it was <laughs> no. because it was like a oh. it was a, it was like an off green, like a real rustic green. And I was just yeah. like, that's so weird that she calls it her brown bag. And I, one day I found out she really meant she brown bag. Was I was like, this is green. This is not brown. And she's like, bring yeah. somebody else here. And she's like, what color is this? Everybody says green. And so, so she, she just didn't did not even know. know. Yeah. And listen to this. Oh, our, no. Our, our oldest son, William, has the same thing. And he oh. was so intuitive when he was like in kindergarten. He would remember what color certain things were. So mm-hmm. when someone says what color, he would be like, oh, apples are red. That's red. But he has oh, it all mixed up, too. Wow. Yeah, so he really? Has the, yep. Okay. And how, like... When you're colorblind, it could be different. So for her, is it all colors or certain colors? I know green and brown's a tough one for her. <laughs> Though they are kind of close. Right. And I would think red and orange probably because that still yeah. looks red to me. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. But, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I'm excited. I digress. You, have y'all heard a little bit about Ann Meyer's story? She's the children's director at West, and she just was reunited with her parents. Yes, yes, so, she shared that yeah, with her. Uh, yeah, it's a really cool conversation yeah. people get to hear. But I wanted to ask y'all real quick. We just released a few weeks ago a little debate on the Billy Graham rule. Mm-hmm. And I think one thing that I should have done that I didn't, but I think the conversation still turned out well, but I should have had a, a woman who was pro because it kind of seemed like a guy against girl thing yeah. with, yeah, with Chip and the two ladies. And I didn't mean it to be that way because yeah. I know a lot of women who are pro Billy Graham rule. So I don't want to go deep into it, but what was y'all's reaction to that conversation? And would y'all say y'all would be examples of women who are pro Billy Graham rule? I would, I am an example of one who's mm-hmm. pro. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I just think it's a good idea. I don't see what it hurts. Yeah. Oh, no. It's just a smart why don't y'all feel like it's disadvantageous for uh, especially being in ministry? Yeah, I think, in, well, for me, it's nuanced. It's a number of things. And I think in, what I liked about that conversation is even um, when you guys talked about like the heart of it. Like we need mm-hmm. to not focus on can I do this or can I do that? Right. And that's with everything in life. Right. Like where's yeah. the line? Right. And that's the wrong question. The question is what is the heart of it? Right. And so I think about when we think of what the heart is, there are things as believers that we're going to have to yield to 
because we're called to a higher standard and we're putting things in place that are protective. Right. Um, and so that's the first thing I thought from that conversation. The other thing is that I just, um, I don't feel like I've been limited in my role in ministry or in my like vocational ministry, you know, as a job, but I don't feel that I've been limited because I'm a woman. I do see where there is growth opportunities. And yeah. sometimes we miss the mark on being intentional um in those in those ways. And even in that episode, um, one of the ladies B mentioned how um in the organization um, or she knew someone who was like, I'm not going to meet with a woman alone, but I'm also not going to meet with a man alone because that would be an unfair advantage. And so I think that was a great example of intentionality where we have a long way to go to shift our perspective. But I do think that there are some things we just have to like lay down our rights and lay down our preferences um, for what we know will bring life and be good. Um, but I haven't felt that in ministry that I've been held back because I'm a woman, yeah. but I've also been in places and spaces where there are men who their lives have been changed by, I mean, we're planted in a church that exists because of two women who, you know, preached to a man mm-hmm. who converted him that changed the whole yeah. tra- trajectory of mm-hmm. the Surratt family. And so, um, I just, for me, I've been in spaces and places where I've had men who have empowered um, and who have been maybe intentional. It feels like it's been intentional um, to empower me, but yeah. Do you, do you get, do you, do you value the conversation as far as, like, I do, I do believe that regardless of whether one agrees with the two ladies' perspectives that they brought to the table, it's a very important conversation yeah. because the stuff that they're bringing up needs to be talked through yeah. because bottom line, whether you agree with their points or not, that's how they feel. And that's how a lot right. of women feel. So mm-hmm. that should be important. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Mm-hmm. But you're with Lynn pretty yeah, much. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we're going to talk two very uh, drastically different things. I want to talk about pants. And then I want to talk. <laughs> Great. I know about pants. And I'm wearing I wanna, them right now. There you actually. Go. And, and then I want to talk about uh, <laughs> Christians who want people to go to hell. Oh. Hard right. Hard yeah. right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Whoa. Yeah. So we're going to laugh. All we're going right. to cry. All right. <laughs> Great. I, I, so since you guys have cared about fashion and style, well, first of all, do you? Do no. you care about fashion and style? <laughs> I'm wearing I'm, yoga pants like, and a suit shirt. you guys care about, I'm like, you got a wrong person. Did, you, like the did least, you ever care? Like, never. Did you, you never, never cared? Never cared. Do you have any knowledge then? Because we may no. just need to go to a different conversation. I have zero. I've had this shirt for like a solid 10, 10 yeah. 15 years. Like I only shop when things like get holes in them. Okay, well then we're so, we're on the same I, playing field right now. I do like I it, but I'll tell you what changed because Lee. This is a I don't know if I've told y'all this, but he used to be a personal stylist for Nordstrom. Did y'all know oh, that yeah. uh, from his yeah. podcast episode? Yes, okay, yeah. And um, so once I got him, I did kind of care, but I've always just been sporty, athletic. That's just what I go to. And then, spice. yeah, and he would like his sporty spice. That's right. <laughs> um, and it, sometimes I would be like, oh, I can't go anywhere. I don't have anything to wear. And then he changed my whole perspective because he was like, just put this on. And are you comfortable? Just wear this. Go with this. So it completely now changed. So now I, I don't care. And I go for comfort. Is that what you pretty much do? Just what? If, yeah. Does it feel good? Yeah. Does it that, feel good? Then that's what you wear, and you look good, and then that gives you a confidence, right? Yeah. Because you feel good. So. And sometimes oh. I forget if I don't look in the mirror, I don't remember what I'm wearing. Me either. Yeah. Yeah. So, am I correct though, from observation, that baggy is coming back for men and women? I think I have I seen think, that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I'm for that. it. <laughs> yeah. I'm for it. Yeah. It hides a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right, Way well, more comfortable. Well, I'm going to I'm going to play a quick audio from a close friend of mine. You guys know him and are friends with him as well, but I told him to give a little plug because he has started a fashion company as well. But Ooh, has I, he? I have I have oh, called okay. Robbie before uh, formal engagements where I was unsure about stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah. he's he's the guy that I call. He's Great. always been a sharp dresser. Sharp he guy. Is. He yeah. does care about yeah. fashion. So I'll, I'll, let me play this real quick. And then I have um, something vulnerable to share about me and pants. Oh, All right? I can't wait to hear <laughs> Nothing it. Nothing weird. I hope not. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hey, Seacoast fam, I miss you guys. This is Robbie Madison. You know, the subject of men's fashion is an interesting one for me. 
I fell into the fashion industry because of my career as a performer, but also because I had a huge disdain for how clothes used to fit me when I was growing up. I was a very skinny kid in a world that could not make clothes big enough for guys. Everything was extremely baggy. The shirts were baggy, the pants were baggy, falling all the way off of you. Everything I bought looked like I was going to a department store in search of parachutes to throw over my body. <laughs> Now, I personally love the early 1900s when guys dressed really cool in their suits, always ready for a good dance or classy function. Once you hit about the mid-1900s, you really had that movement of guys who were in the Levi jeans. You know what I'm talking about. Now, in the 70s and 80s, guys' pants were influenced by the disco era. You started to see more bell-bottoms and even some high-waisted pants. This was a super fun look, actually one that I still prefer today. Then in the 90s, you would get into more of the baggy style. Early 2000s, a little less baggy and a little more bootleg cut. You know, that Old Navy style. <laughs> you would add some fake paint to make you look really cool. Now, you were actually cooler if you added fake paint plus a few holes here and there. Then probably around 2010 or so, pants got smaller and smaller until you had the skinny jean phase. Now, this is when all of the worship leaders across America basically just started painting pants onto their skin and calling them skinny jeans. <laughs> Now we're back to more of the loose, <laughs> relaxed wrong. cut. And it's starting to get bigger and bigger again, it seems. You get joggers, cargo pants are back. Even the 90s baggy pants are back. I just say that we just need a good sized waist for all of the millennial dads out there and a slight flare on the bottom for style. Now, of course, there's nothing like a custom fit, which is what my company focuses on, is taking your actual measurements and crafting pants that fit your body perfectly. But we're more on the formal side for now. So if you don't want your pants falling off or painted on you, Come see me, and we can get you right at Robert Wayne Custom. But Joey, I am just wondering, are we going to see you in some baggy jeans? Or are you going to bring back the holy jeans? If so, you know I'll support you, bro. From now until the nursing home. <laughs> we joke around about being in a nursing home together. So here is, here's the little confession that I have. So I grew up in the 90s. I had back. I mean, just, I, I see things, pictures of me in high school. I mean, we're talking one of my legs. I could put both of my legs in, you know, mm, one, one of the yeah. pant legs. I mean, Would just love to huge, see a picture. huge. Oh yeah. So as I became, I guess, an adult, I just thought that fitted jeans just looked better. And I had some of my peers who came from the same nineties, like, Oh my gosh, you're wearing skinny jeans. I'm like, these aren't skinny jeans. They're fitted jeans. And then I talked to a, a different friend of mine, who he, he was kind of going through the same thing. He's just like, bottom line, Joey, is that old style. It just doesn't look good. Fitted looks a lot better. So I've kind of stayed with it. But here, here's the thing I want to ask y'all. I really like plaid pants. I love plaid pants. I just think it looks retro and cool, but I cannot find a uh, a like lesser hip version because I'm 46 years old. I don't need to look like super hip. So I bought two pairs of plaid pants. I wore one of them today and I'm about to give up on them. I like plaid so much, but I just think these are too Let's tight. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can you do a squat in those and a lunge? Yes, because they're like they're stretchy. They're stretchy, they're stretchy. but they just look they they look skinny. They don't look they? Skinny. They yeah. do look skinny. Yeah. So do, do I look like an old person trying to look cool? You can say, can I can you stand up so we can see the whole thing? I just Again, stood up. I can't see with the table. Like the whole put together. Okay, I'll take my yeah, headphones off. Yeah, take that off. off so we can get a real look. And spin around. <laughs> I mean, it has like a cool like vintage 50s, 60s look to it, right? Like it, that's, what I, hope for. that's I, what I hope for. I have two just like this and I'm I'm almost about to give them away because I just think they're too skinny. Are you comfortable or are they uncomfortable to you? Like, oh, they feel comfortable because so feel, they're stretchy. Then that's what you go on. I think you look fabulous. See, my thought is it. not, and again, I'm not a fashion person, so you can take this with a grain I bet of you salt. nine out of ten sea coasters would say, oh, Lynn's fashionable. Oh, so um, <laughs> she totally is. You, you asked the question, do I look like an old guy trying to be hip? And I don't think so. I think you look like someone who has had that since it was first around and it just came back around and you're still wearing it. Gotcha. Because see, I never went. I never Fair went statement. skinny jeans, mm -hmm. but yeah. I feel like these are borderline. Yeah. All right. I like it. All right. Well, especially thanks. if you like it and if you're comfortable, I think that's yeah. what you do. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate Own that. It. All right. Well, now we're going to go to Christians that want people to suffer yeah. eternally. Okay. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need a drink first. <laughs> Let me give you two encounters that I've had recently. One was on a podcast episode, and I do feel like some of this is a tread carefully sort of topic because this was a... I. I did a podcast interview with someone whose parents were involved in the Holocaust. Ooh. All right. So he also, so he is uh, Jewish, but also learns from, you know, New Testament teachings, very unique guy. And I just kind of asked almost in an assuming way, hey, we're both kind of talking from a Christian faith perspective. So how, how do you find forgiveness for Hitler specifically and Nazi Germany and all that. And I was a little surprised. He he actually pushed back and said, no, there are certain people that they need to be punished eternally. Like that would be an example. Like there's there's there would be no good out of someone like that, you know, getting off pretty much, you know, free, mm-hmm. not burning in hell forever, I guess. And then someone that I'm actually close to, we were talking about something and I forgot, you know, just a bunch of different theological stuff. And he said something to the point of, well, this person that hurt me, if they never apologize, if they never come clean, if they never make amends, at least there will be punishment someday and had comfort in that. And so I, 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 I'm not knocking either one of those people. I understand that all of that comes from hurt, but I'm curious, do you guys think that there is, I don't, I don't know if I want to avoid the word problem. I'll just use the word problem. Do you think there's a problem going on in a, in a Christian's heart if they're leaning on punishment to bring them contentment? I think that's hard. I've had, it's so crazy you asked this. I've had this conversation recently um there is the the struggle with our faith and us having to work out our faith with fear and trembling um in this issue of forgiveness it's like he's not asking us to forgive just the light things mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. like forgiveness extends to the horrific evil things and so at the end of the day i just stand at the point where um if someone accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior and they've like believed in their heart and confessed with their lips and they come to know the Lord, they don't get eternal punishment. And so when we are thinking about, I am, I find solace and comfort in the horrific pain that I've gone through because I know someone's going to get judgment or I know someone's going to get justice we don't know what God's justice is. Mm-hmm. His justice may be that they don't know him, that they don't acknowledge him as Lord, and they like get the eternal punishment because they didn't receive him. Mm-hmm. Um, but their but their justice may be that they come to know the evil that was done and they accept him as Lord. And like the just, I don't know. I think we just mm-hmm. it is it's mm-hmm. rocky shaky ground Mm -hmm. to build a theology of of comfort and solace on justice because you don't know what God's justice is. Um, And the hope that he's going to punish is what gets you through. I think that that is, um, because even like this morning, (laughs) I'm reading Isaiah and like there's this verse that says like in the end, like, he will, he will, the Lord will bless Egypt and Assyria. And he will say, Egypt are my people and Assyria um, are, I, I forget the word that he used, and Israel is my inheritance. Mm-hmm. And so even these nations that were evil mm-hmm. and oppressed and murdered and were violent towards his chosen people, in the end, the goal is for them to know him. And those who don't right. know him, are going to get what's due from not knowing or accepting him. And then those who know him are. And so even when you look at that, where he sends his prophet to say, like, can you imagine what 
Israel felt when they heard a prophet saying like, oh, Egypt are my people. Yeah. And Assyria, like my workmanship, I think is what the the word that was used in the NIV. And Israel's my inheritance and they will know me and call on me and mm-hmm. worship me. I mean, that is a hard mm-hmm. thing to hear. And so yeah, I think it's shaky ground. Yeah. Yeah. Would, mm-hmm. would, would y'all find this? So I... And again, I, I want to be careful because I I don't have the baggage of thinking through my grandparents in the Holocaust and, mm-hmm. and my yeah. parents mourning, knowing what their parents went through. Yeah. But I find this a very beautiful thought, imagining, like, uh, again, we, we have no idea what happens after someone dies and, and any of that. We don't know what's going on in someone's heart before they die, mm-hmm. anything like that. But imagine someone like Hitler standing before the throne, seeing God in his glory and splendor and actually feeling that love breaking, like absolutely breaking, sobbing, and then the nation of Israel surrounding him, praying for him, like saying, we forgive you. You know, mm-hmm. um, you knew not what you were doing. Like, doesn't that sound, that sounds like a beautiful thought. Uh, like the re- redemption of our, our go-to, like the vilest, you know, one of the vilest human beings, that's uh-huh. our go-to, Hitler. And the mm-hmm. thought of that sort of redemption, I mean, it seems like the the more hopeless someone appears, the more beautiful that redemption is. Right. But what yeah. do you think about all this? Amy? I agree. Yeah. That's true. I mean, because it definitely is, I feel like a lot of us struggle with that because, I mean, in reality, our human brains, if someone does something in evil, that's, I hope they get what they deserve or, you know, even something as little as in traffic. If I've had to catch myself, if someone cut me off, well, I hope they get a ticket or I hope this happens. Yeah. And I know immediately, and especially my kids now that they're older, like, mom, that's not that's not the right thing. <laughs> like, say oh, that loud. Loud. <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, I have more people who want to be accountable, uh, but but yeah, it definitely is. It's hard to have someone like actually went through that and to love yeah. the person and not have a even like a thought of like I hope they get. So I, I understand. Yeah, totally. But I agree with what you're saying. If you accept Jesus and you love Jesus, I mean, that's all God wanted. So I mean, we kind of. Right. Have to want that too, and not think that way. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Yeah, and and the thought to to me too that I go back to, and and some of this has to do with something you know Chip has drilled into my brain. The whole everybody's doing the best they can with mm-hmm. what they have. Mm-hmm. I think of little little baby Adolf Hitler, mm-hmm. innocent. I don't know. Pro- probably yeah. an ugly baby. No offense to yeah, Hitler, but definitely. probably an ugly baby. But <laughs> could could have a cute personality, giggly, mm-hmm. just like any other baby. Think of baby Martin, Martin Luther King, Mm -hmm. cute little baby. I mean, what's the difference? Very little difference. They're two baby humans. What happened? What happened to Adolf to make him so full of hate and wanting to like so warped to think that we need to kill everybody that's not this superhuman race you know we we that's the direction we want to go and then you have someone like Martin Luther King who was wronged and has nothing but love to retaliate right it's like what yeah. happened holy like, spirit is the only it, difference it, right mm-hmm. and that's like the hard part of like mm-hmm. I mean, the Holocaust is horrific. Yes, and I'm not making excuses. Yes, and, and so, like, that's the hard part of working it out. And, yep. like, how do you, like, looking at the two people and saying, what's the difference? Mm-hmm. And it's like, it is by the grace of God yeah. that we know him. Yeah. You know? Oh. Right. I yeah. Don't know what to do do you, w- would y'all be comfortable with saying, to some degree, we're all, uh, uh, and, and again, I want to make clear that, uh, Hitler is responsible for everything that he did. Do you think that there is an element of victimhood that we all have based on things that happened that we had no control over? We did not have control over our upbringing, what parents we had, whether or not they were abusive, whether or not they were addicts, whether or not they believed or didn't believe or believed in this or believed in that. There's some sort of victimhood that I think we all experience that because it would imagine i would imagine that being a victim is having something done to you or mm-hmm. taught to you that was not in your control seems like that's all of us yeah i mm-hmm. mean i think that and i don't know that i would 
I see your point. I don't know that I would say victimhood. Um, but we, like, we all have experiences that how we handle them could, le- like, it's not, it doesn't have power over us, but we all have a propensity to live out of what happened to us mm-hmm. instead of what we could be. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, all because we yeah. were all, I mean, even, like, Hitler and Martin Luther King Jr. as babies were sinful, right? And so, like, the, the question is, like, you're, we all have a propensity for sin because right. it, we're sinful in our mother's womb. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, what, where do we move with it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. All right. So mm-hmm. the, the, I love this question. Y'all might hate it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you had the choice... If and I and, have and, a choice. and I will and I I'll tell you what I'll, I'll I will tell y'all Chip's answer to this question after um, we answer or before before, before. <laughs> I want to know what Chip thinks first. <laughs> if if you had the choice to lead Lucifer to repentance and redemption, would you? No. No. <laughs> I wish our, our listeners could see Amy's face right yeah. now. <laughs> they, well, the listeners need to hop over to YouTube and they can see yeah. Yes, they can. Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, that's scary. No. Yeah. yeah. Chip said, yeah. He's just like, you know, mm. if, anybody, if anybody has the heart to repent, I say, let them have what they're after. Mm. All right. Thank you for listening to the Seacoast. <laughs> That is a scary, scary thought. Like, I'm still like, oh, my gosh. Like, I'm trying uh, to think in my brain, yeah. what all does that entail? And like, I think that I think it entails nothing. And I got, think that's why I answered that way. Because I'm like, he stood in the presence of the almighty yeah. God. Right. Like, there isn't an opportunity for repentance. Because you, you know him. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. stood in his presence. Judas. Y'all would love to see, I would love to see Judas in heaven. I, I don't think, I think Judas was definitely made to be way worse. Like any of us could have fallen into that, especially yeah. when the disciples as a whole weren't even convinced of what, who Jesus actually was yeah. until he actually yeah. rose. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Judas is, it'll be interesting. It will Judas be interesting. Is, is heartbreaking. It will be interesting. Hey, I do, I, I want to, you know, as we, as we move on to uh, Ann Meyer, and you're going to love this story, I do want to thank our listenership because the style of this podcast is outward processing. We don't come to the table thinking that we have all of our thoughts organized and everything. So yeah. if anything that we say or comments or, or anything like that, um, you know, rub you the wrong way, just know that we are outwardly processing. And sometimes I say stuff that rub me the wrong no way. way. Yes, I rub me the wrong way. <laughs> all right, guys, it's Ann Meyer. You guys are going to love this. Well, welcome. We're happy to have you. <clears throat> Thanks you for are, having you me. You are Seacoast family. Whoop, whoop. As of how many years? You've been working here for 10 years? For 10 years. And um, have you been here longer? Yes. So I came on staff in September of 2014. And... Our family joined Seacoast probably 2012, and then I started volunteering in about 2013. So, Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Ann Meyer, everybody. And you say your family. Husband, you have kids? Yes. Uh, Jason and I have been married this May. We'll be 23 years. Nice. Um, and we were high school sweethearts, and we have two children. So, McKenna is 16, and Evan is 12. Gotcha. Yep. High school sweethearts. High school sweethearts. That's pretty crazy. So, you grew <coughs> up in the Somerville area? Yes. We grew up kind of like North Charleston, um, but went to Fort Dorchester High School. We yeah. were the first graduating class there. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So, not to show our age a lot, but, you know. <laughs> no, feel free. When did you yeah. graduate? <laughs> um, how, so, how did y'all end up at Seacoast? We live in Carolina Bay, and so there were a lot of friends of ours, neighbors, that attended Seacoast. And so, we were not in a church at the time, and it was one of my, like, every year would come around, and I was like, we're going to get back into church. This is going to be the year. Right. And then, um, we just had some friends. I grew up Baptist, and wasn't sure I could get on board with not having a preacher right. live at the campus. And so that was an adjustment, watching a screen. But when we finally finally got there, it was home. Right. One of the 
Josh's open, Pastor Josh's open with a prayer, and he included a prayer about his uh, uh, fantasy football team. <laughs> and Jason played fantasy football, so I was like, oh my gosh, we are so in. Um, Sign me up. Yeah, so that was a really cool, you know, just a little connection. Yeah. Um, right off the bat, we realized that they were real and— right. All right. Personable. So, yeah, I was just telling you how I was there. Uh, Priscilla and I were both working at the West Campus from about 05 to 08 student ministry. Now, these these kids that I had in student ministry at the time are like in their 30s now. I know. I didn't say it's not right. It's not. <laughs> I was a preschool teacher for about five years, and one of them, little girls that I taught, just turned 14. And I was like, that is not okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling somebody the other day that I will have this sort of moment multiple times in the week where I'm looking at somebody and I'm like, in my head, I, I, my brain is just registering them as, oh, they're older than me. And then I stop and I pause and I'm like, wait, I'm probably older than them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is insane. And I, I just, I don't know. Do you feel old? Do you feel no, your age? I don't either. No. <laughs> I don't either. No. I guess that's good news. Yes, that's that good is news. good. All right. So... I am I am really excited about this story. Heard kind of a snapshot of it at All Staff Christmas Day of 2022. Yes. Oh my gosh. Is that seriously when you got a message as far as like hey we found a yes. we found a match so, a DNA match? We my family started traveling um for Christmas a couple of years ago. So we had just landed in Vegas and when we got off the plane my husband was like, "Oh, I just got a message from a Michael Bolt." And his name clicked in my head. Um, his son was in my preschool class at church. So I was like, oh, it's probably just a family trying to establish some community, right. get to know people. And then I realized he also friended me on Facebook. And so we both accepted. And then we kind of went about the day getting to the hotel and all that stuff. So about that time we got to the hotel, Michael sent me a message and um, you know, just sort of asked me, Kind of like getting to know me. At the time, I don't think he realized that I was his son's preschool teacher at gotcha. church. Gotcha. Um, so he told me that his brother had done a DNA test, and his results just came back that day, Christmas Day, and I was flagged as a first cousin. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And so, you know, like, we're trying to get unpacked and get ready. You know, we're going out sightseeing and stuff, just got to Vegas, and— Throughout the day, he continues to send me messages. Yeah. And so it wasn't very long into the messages that I realized this was more than just somebody wanting to establish community. You know, he asked me at one point um, if I knew my birth parents. And I was, that's what kind of when I was like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this Chill. is a little different. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I answered, I said, I don't. Um, and then he asked me, he knew my birthday. And then, you know, he, and he was very reserved. Like he was holding back and he was like, let me just, I realize it's not really my place to like Gosh. divulge all this information. So he would, I know, bit, yeah. he would take a break and he would pray about it. And then he'd come back. And um, I mean, this went over on for several hours throughout the day. Um, and then throughout Christmas day, Christmas day. Gosh. Yeah. And he was sort of doing it secretly. Like he was at his family's house and um, they were celebrating Christmas and, but he just couldn't, he was just beside himself because he knew what this meant. Um, and so he, <clears throat> I can remember we were standing in line. I was buying tickets for a gondola ride for our family. And he asked me what I wanted to know. And I was like, well, I want to know everything you know. So, you know, please tell me. And so that's when, like, he had typed up a message and told me that about my birth parents, that they were 16 when they got pregnant. Um and he, you know, just told me a little bit more information about it. And then I remember the one thing that kind of, I read it. And then I was like, oh my gosh, Jason, this is everything I've always wanted to know. And I like handed it to him for him to read. And then the one thing that stuck out was that he referred to them as my birth parents. So I was like, hold on, you mean like they're still together? And so sure enough, they got married three years after they had me. So. Wow. They graduated high school. And at this point, they're telling you stuff that you know nothing about. Like, know nothing you don't about. Know, you don't, you've never had any clues about your biological parents. The only thing I knew, like when I was in elementary school, we had to do a project and it was about your heritage. And so my parents told me at the time, well, we don't know because you were adopted. And I just remember being like, okay, that's cool. My back I was Really? You know, I was like, 
yeah, I was loved and, you know, had a I had brothers and sisters and And I was gonna ask you that. So it, it was not a hard hit when no. you when you found that out. And did no. it ever become difficult to be like, gosh. It never did. Yeah. Um and I just contribute that to the family that right. you know the Lord placed me right. in. Sure. Um sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, no, no. Um so that they, you know, had been married at this point forty two years. And he told me that I had three brothers, all, you know, they were my biological Full brothers. Yeah. Um, a set of twins three years after they got married, and then um, a younger brother uh, two years after them. So, I mean, it, it was amazing, you yeah. know, to hear like I have this whole biological family unit that is together and. You know, it was just right. really, it was really neat. And you're the, and you're the oldest. And I'm the oldest. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. yeah. And they never had another girl, you know, like it, there was just a lot of really special, special things to that. Yeah. Um, and you were, you were flagged because you had submitted your DNA for your own background? Yes. Okay. That's, so, otherwise they would have never found you. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So both of my adoptive parents passed, my mother in 2014 and then my dad in 2016, about 22 months apart. And so 2017, um, I decided to do a DNA test just to find out my origin. And I can remember getting the results back and working with Karen at church. And it it said that I was like, England, you know, somewhere over there, Scottish. And she was like, can you submit a picture? Because that is not what you look like, you know. <laughs> and so that was, it was pretty comical. But I just sort of left it at that. You know, that's all I really wanted to know. Uh, probably 20, 2020, maybe, I did another DNA test just to find out, like, genetic stuff because it's come so far. Um, and, but yeah, so, like, because I had done Ancestry, my now cousin has done Ancestry, and he actually attends the Mount Pleasant campus, the one that I matched with. Yeah. Um, and he did it for for some, of, I can't remember the reason why he did it, but the fact that he and his wife did them in the same day, sent him off the same time, and his came back Christmas Day. His wife didn't come back until like January. Yeah. So like that was just cool too. Um, tell and, us, tell us about your your and and let's let's get some terminology ironed out here. Do we say your parents and then your biological parents? How do you how do you term these? Yeah, it's. I don't know. It, I'm still sort of like right. trying to. Yeah, this is pretty new that. stuff. Yeah. It's pretty new stuff. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit about your parents who've passed away. Yeah. So they, um, my mom, Pam, mm-hmm. my adopted mom, she could never have children. Gotcha. Um, and so that was always very special. Mm-hmm. Take your time. Wow. Take your time. This is heavy, heavy stuff. Yeah. In a good way, right? Yeah, <laughs> it is. A year ago, I couldn't talk about it at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she, <clears throat> she could conceive children, but never carry them. Mm-hmm. And so early on and like, um, talking with my biological mom, Donna, I always wanted her to know like her selfless act of, you know, giving me up really meant the world because she gave my adoptive mom wow. a chance to, <laughs> give, you're gonna give I know. me crying. <laughs> Um, Gosh. and so I was, she never, you know, she remarried and I had, um, three step siblings, but I mean, she, I was all she had Mm -hmm. and that was really, it was really neat. Yeah. Um, but, and then my dad, my stepdad, he was married before and had three children that he brought to their marriage when they got married. I was five. Um, but I mean. Those are my parents. That's- yeah. Now you said uh, so with your uh, the parents that raised you. You said stepdad. Yes. Yeah. So my my mom adoptive mom Pam was married before. Okay. When she adopted me, okay. and um, she lived like in the same town where my biological parents lived. Gotcha. Um, and he had an affair, so they divorced, and she moved back to the Charleston area. Do you ever know him? No, not really. Yeah. Not not enough. Yeah. Um, his parents kept in touch with me over the years, and they actually are the ones that made it possible for me to go to college. And they had a beach house that they would come get me every summer, and so I'd spend the summers with them. Um, 
But as far as him, I never really had a relationship with him. Yeah. So thinking thinking about your childhood, it didn't rock your world when you found out, but was it something that was always of interest to you as far as where you came from, who your parents were? Was it, or as a child, you're just like, I don't care. These are my parents. I mean, that was sort of my philosophy. I never wanted my adoptive parents to ever feel like they didn't provide or weren't enough. So I never had any desire to seek out my birth parents Mm -hmm. or, you know, I'd always assumed just a birth mother right? because I knew that she was young. That was one thing they, my adoptive parents told me in elementary school was that, you know, it was a young pregnancy and they made the decision to give me up for adoption. Um, And then it's, it's actually interesting because looking back, I wasn't, it was my birth mother's choice so I wanted it to be her choice to try to find me. I didn't want to ever impose. Um, and then talking through it, she felt the same. Yeah. She wanted me to find her, Gosh. but the adoption was closed. So she could never talk about it. So her and my dad never could tell my brothers. They never could talk about it to anybody. So wow. um, that was you know, hard for them. So they were the only two who knew about your existence. Yeah. Golly. She, my mother was the youngest of three sisters. So her middle sister is the one whose brothers did the, I mean, sons did the DNA test. And Michael, the one that reached out on Christmas day, told me that he knew a little bit about the story. Like his mom used it as like a life lesson for the boys as they were growing up. Um, So he, He vaguely knew. That's why I think he was so excited when he, when I, you know, matched as a first cousin because he knew that I was the cousin that Mm -hmm. he had always heard about. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, that was really cool. Yeah. So tell, tell me how things led to, oh my gosh, I'm going to meet my parents, the, the, my biological parents. How did that transpire? So we, FaceTimed for the first time on January 2nd, and Michael and his family, they all came to church um, New Year's Day, I believe. Um, So Michael and his brother, Matthew, they brought all their, you know, to meet me as officially their cousin. Um, And we set up a a date to, so my parents decided to uh, take a few days to collect themselves. And they... Talk, they told my brothers on New Year's Day, New Year's wow. Eve, New Year's Day, that they had a, sist- uh, a sister. So when my mother found out, her sister, um, Miriam, the middle sister, had a picture of me and brought, you know, the two sisters, you know, brought my mom, Donna, out to the porch and um, had this picture. And she said something along the lines of, we have something to tell you. Um, maybe it was like we found somebody and my mom said, did you find my baby girl? Um, and so they showed a picture, her a picture of us. And, um, gosh. And so then I think my dad took, his name is Kyle and he took a little bit, you know, went out and took a walk and, um, came back. And so they decided to tell my brothers New Year's Day, either New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. Um, and so they had this picture of our family from Seacoast. <laughs> It was like a Mother's Day picture. And my dad was trying to get it up on the TV and he couldn't get it to work. So he was like, he asked one of the, one of the sister-in-laws to put it up there. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, what, why do we have this picture of these people? You know? Um, So then he, he told them that, well, this is your sister. Gosh. And um, so then one of my brothers, they, you know, took them a little bit, but they were like, well, hold on. What does that mean? You know, they were playing all these different scenarios in their head, like, they thought maybe somebody had an affair or, you know, something of that nature. And so they were able to tell them, you know, we didn't, you know, we got pregnant at 16. Um, and so we FaceTimed for the first time on January 2nd, which was actually their anniversary, which I didn't know that at the time. Um, were you nervous or just excited or just numb? I mean, how did you feel? I mean, I was excited. It was, I mean you know, the moment that I've thought about for a really long time was finally here. Yeah. Um, 
So, I mean, it was neat. It was, it was I mean, all the things. Right. <laughs> you yeah. Know, like, right. I, I bet it's almost hard to describe. Yeah. There, yeah. That's what we've said this whole year. There are really no words. Right. Um, it, because it's just been amazing. Now, having spent time now with your biological parents, did they think this was ever going to happen? Like, did they have expectation like one of these days we'll be reunited or were they just like, we may never, we may never meet her? Um, I don't, I'm not really sure yeah. to be honest. Um, I know that early on before we FaceTimed, like we text you, we would send a lot of messages back and forth. And my mom at one point sent, <clears throat> I wanted her to know that I never resented them. I was always super thankful for life. Mm -hmm. Um, because in high school, you know, I knew people that had abortions and I was just very grateful that they chose to, you know, that she chose to carry me and give me up. Because mm -hmm. I know that as a mom, I know that right. had to be hard. Oh, yeah. So I never, I wanted them to know that I was just always very grateful for them. Right. For their decision. And... um she wrote me back this really long text about all the things, the prayers that they had for me my whole life. Wow. And I can remember that day I couldn't go to work because I was like, Karen, I get this is too much. <laughs> like, in a good way, you know, right. but like it was. And for them to see all the things that they have prayed for for 44 years, like how faithful the Lord has been. Wow. And yeah, it's. And there's been so many, we call them little God winks in our whole story. Yeah, I got to hear them. Yeah, I was trying to even think back. So, you know, as we're getting to know each other, my first two jobs, I worked at Wendy's and then at Belk. And my mom's first two jobs were the exact same two places. Oh, my god! I mean, <laughs> Wendy's all, and Belk. <laughs> Wendy's and Belk. Of all the places wow. that where you could work. Right. Um, I played softball growing up, and my dad was a baseball player. And so <clears throat> he had aspirations to play, you know, take his career into the major leagues. I, I'm guessing that's where, you know, he played in college. And <clears throat> he had an injury in college, but we essentially, like, played the same positions. Um, played second base and outfield. And at one point he was asking me about, um, you know, like, how well I, I did batting. And I was like, well, you know, like... I was a good bunter mm. and I was fast. So like I, I got on base a lot and um, same with him. And so there's just a lot of like characteristics yeah. that we have, you know, that are very similar personalities. Um, so that's neat. My kids, Evan has always in sports been like number four, but this last season of soccer, he was put on a new team. So they assigned him a number. It was number 11. And at first we were like, well, we're always four, you right. know, we don't necessarily want to be 11, but we, we stuck with it. And then McKenna chose number 11. Turns out my dad was number 11. Wow. I mean, there's just been all these little really cool. Yeah. There's um, a lot of numbers and to be uh, yeah. 11. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, there's, we use a code at our house for some, some things that is a forged code. It's my mom's birthday. I mean. Right. That's, you know, that's on that, that you're the code to that y'all been using was your mom's birthday. It happens to be a birthday. Four digits. Four digits. Oh um, it started out as my mother in law's or my husband's grandfather's birthday. Yeah. So that's where it came from. But it's also like her, the fact that it's her birthday too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I could see like Jesus in heaven being like, "Hey guys, watch this. I know. Look, yeah. Look, yeah, at, look like, at what the code's gonna be. <laughs> look what we're gonna do here. Let's just reveal this. Hey." Is this so? I just please uh, understand if anything I say sounds off-putting. It's not intentional. No. I'm I'm curious. Do you think that this process and this reunion is less complicated, given that your parents who raised you are gone? Like, would this be trickier? I think it would be. Um, just be for the sense of. I mean, I would love for them to have met, um, but I think it would have been a little harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Is it, does it feel like, like you lost your parents eight and 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. 
is it do you feel like blessed from a standpoint of and and again i'm not not trying to sound lighthearted about something that is just so beautiful and precious but if i lose my parents my parents are gone and i don't have anybody else coming along where the parents that raised you those are your parents they're gone but then it's like oh i have parents now you know what i'm saying yeah. like do you, like do you have that parent connection with your parents now to where it's like it's it's an adult form but it's still well these are my parents or we is that d- taking time i mean I, I mean it's definitely taking time yeah um and i because you can't replicate the closeness that you had with your deceased parents because right. there was so much time invested. So much yeah. time invested. And, um, you know, that's who I knew as my parents um, and to have that bond. But it is interesting and neat to see the bond that we're developing now, you know, with my, my birth parents. Uh, because they jumped in from day one um, and they've just been... Evan travels a lot with soccer, and McKenna's been traveling a lot. Um, we've never played. They live near Asheville. We've never played softball in Asheville, but this past summer we did. Mm-hmm. Like, just another God thing. Um, they Most of our tournaments are, you know, could be about like two hours away from where they live, and so they don't think anything of it. They just hop in the car and come, come see a game, and um, they're definitely very invested, and yeah. it's been, they've, since we met each other last January, they have been coming down at least once a month. And so we try to see each other that way. Right. Um, if we're not going there, they're coming here. And um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely going to take time, right. Right. but, um, but we're, yeah. we're making our own set of memories, right. you know? Right. So when you're interacting with your biological parents as basically strangers, you know, initially, mm-hmm. Was there any sort of connection that you felt, even though you did not know them, like just being in their presence and your siblings? What did you feel some sort of heart connection or not? Not really. Um, there was definitely a heart connection, but I mean, still from the standpoint of, you know, strangers to me is kind of like a harsh word. Yeah, sure. Be- because they were they are my biological parents, mm-hmm. but. Just not knowing them, right. I guess. Um, yeah, that's a good point. You know, mm-hmm. just not knowing their, but our personalities are a lot of like, one of the first things my dad asked me when we met um, on January 18th, when he came to our house, he wanted to see what my toes looked like because <laughs> apparently there is, um, I have a bunion and it's hereditary. Yeah. And so my mom has it, her mom had it. And this whole time I thought I danced for a long time. So I just thought it had something to do with, you right. know, the point shoes that nope, I wore you, first. Like, you have a lineage of bunions. But, nope, but it, <laughs> I mean, the funniest thing, he was just like, take off your sock and your shoe. Let's see your toes. <laughs> um, but, uh, did, did they have any regrets? Have, have they, you know, uh, maybe even from a perspective <clears throat> of, we know we did the right thing, but man, we, we it, missed out a lot. It was hard for my mom. She, mentioned she had to go to counseling um when she gave you up when she gave me up yeah um and then i'm i mean i don't really want to speak for them but you know they made the choice that they felt led to make and um you know i was replaced with the mom that couldn't have children you know so there are I don't like to to do the what ifs because you yep. could what if yourself yep. in a crazy series of, you know, never ending what ifs. It's the story God wrote. And it's been like such a blessing that they were faithful, you know, and, yep. Yep. and, and, and followed through with what they felt you know, God, how they felt God led them. So. Right. right. So my, uh, let's see if I can get this all right. My great grandmother was very promiscuous and birthed my grandmother who never knew who her father was. And then literally we're talking maybe 10 years ago. So right before my grandmother passed away, some of my other family members figured some things out mm. because they knew where my great grandmother lived. And so they found out where her father was and everything. My grandma was like, so 
I don't, I don't care. I don't want to see. I don't want to meet or anything. Could you understand someone being in your sim in your position? But it's just like it's just too too complicated. I don't, I can't do it. Or, or, or does that sound super foreign to you? Like, why would you ever pass up on that? Because I, no. I would feel like, why would you ever pass yeah. up on that? <laughs> I mean, that was part of, you know, why I never reached out because I didn't. It was a decision that was made a really 44 years ago, you know, and. I know it was a hard one. And so Jason, my husband's cousin, actually experienced something like that. She was adopted, found her birth mother, and her birth mother wasn't in a place to um, make a relationship and, you know, move forward with her. And so I know that hurt. Um, So I I just wanted to be respectful. Like I wanted my mom, Donna, to know just how thankful I was. But if she wasn't in that place, that was fine. Um, but thankfully, that's not that's not how it worked out, and they were very open to to meeting and receiving. And mm-hmm. um, my mom said every year on my birthday she would sing happy birthday to me. But they would take a walk, and um, anytime somebody a young girl passed away, she'd always have to look at their birthday oh to make sure it wasn't me. Right. Um. But yeah, yeah. Do Do you know? whether or not on your uh on your biological parents journey like in their mind so they they didn't tell anybody but in their mind like I, i'm trying to imagine if so i have four kids at home if i had a fifth kid who was older and i didn't know would i think of myself as a parent of five probably just like i don't think i would ever be able to dismiss that in my head. Like I have five kids. I just happen not to be a part of one of their lives. I mean, that's, that's all, that sounds like it was always in their head. Always. It was always in their head. And I think my mom actually mentioned that. And I don't know that it was until a little bit later. um, But she said, she actually told somebody at church one day when she came and, um, you know, everybody at church just loves the story. So they were so excited to meet them. Um, And she said that it, it was a little bit later, but she, came to the realization, like, no, I do have four children. I just wasn't, you know, able to raise one. Yeah. Um, I don't know that that was, you know, her response. She probably wanted it to be, but because, you know, the circumstances, um, I'm not sure how she answered it before that. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, what's your biological parents' names? Donna and Kyle. Donna and Kyle. Mm-hmm. Well, I would assume they're probably going to listen to this. So I am very uh, humbled to be able to speak directly to you two just saying, gosh, I don't, congratulations feels <laughs> very, uh, very surfacey, but the deepest, sincerest congratulations. My gosh, this has, this has turned their world upside down. I mean, absolutely. And yours too. Yeah. So uh, obviously lots of emotions here. Is, is it all beauty? Oh, it like is. Like when you're crying right now, it's it's just all beauty. Yeah. Overwhelming beauty, I yeah. bet. Yeah. I mean, from from your parents who raised you, from your parents who sacrificed and gave you up so that you could, yeah, it just, it's all beauty. It is. It's all beauty. It's all just the Lord's hand, you know, just seeing, sometimes you can't see his work until you step back and see the years. And I'm sure t- to see it from their perspective. Is one thing, but then to see it, you know, just the way the Lord works is really amazing. Yeah. Like even when I think about the age of my mother-in-law, my mom, and my adoptive mom, they were all 10 years apart. So my mother-in-law was born in 41. My stepmom, I mean, my adoptive mom was born in 51, and then she was born in 61. Wow. But my husband and I are the exact same age. We're only two months apart. Yeah. Um, And just to think about the way the Lord put all that together. You know? Yeah. Yep. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Like people are really going to be in that uh, people are in for a treat. This is a beautiful beautiful story. So thank, oh, thank you, you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, for sure. You've been listening to the Things You Won't Hear on Sunday Seacoast podcast. In the show notes, you'll see a link to our Facebook group page. Also, we'd love for you to consider subscribing so you get these episodes downloaded right when they come out. Thanks so much for listening.